Bibles will go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. As I was studying this week and trying to just kind of figure out kind of the direction, because uh, honestly, this week was supposed to be part of last week, but I just kind of stretched last week out a little bit. And, I don't think I'll get all the way through this chapter this week. I don't know. We'll see. But, you know, when you study the book of Acts, you'll find that it's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, leading the early church. They weren't committee-led. They weren't deacon-led. Uh, they weren't uh, officers-led. They were spirit-led. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't use men, and we'll get to those things, but I want you to, as you do this, understand that Jesus Christ breathed his spirit on his disciples. 
Today, uh, or last week, we, lo- we looked at the fact that the Holy Ghost, the empowerment of God and his supernatural ability uh, uh, to reach the lost came upon the disciples as they went out and testified of his works to those that they met. And this morning, I want us to understand that we simply have no excuse for not following the Holy Spirit, except for one. I don't want to. Verse 22 says this of Acts chapter 2, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. I want you to pay attention to that. David has written this. Peter is uh, 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 using the word of God as he preaches to these folks that have gathered. And he says this. David said this long before Jesus ever came. He said, Thou hast made me, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. I want you to pay close attention to that. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. If anyone knew what it meant to let life get him to a place where he did not want to be, but then to turn from himself unto his God, David was it. David is one who we can definitely see, a repentant heart, seeking restitution and restoration for his wrongdoings. And he says, you've made known to me the ways of life. The child of God cannot claim ignorance. Ignorance in the child of God is willing. And Peter is making sure they understand that ignorance to them is a willing ignorance because they have seen these things. They know the Old Testament. This is a group of Jews that have gathered together. He says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he should raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Now here he's talking about his fellow church members, the disciples that were with him. They were all witnesses. All 120 had watched Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter saith unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls. God, I come to you one more time. Lord, your word is given to us so that we might know you. But Lord, your word also, Lord, is more than just something that gives us knowledge of who you are. But God, your word is where we find life. 
Lord, it's, it's where our faith comes from. Lord God, your word is what your spirit is pointing us to. I'm asking you, Lord, as we look to your word, that your spirit would have liberty in my heart, God. Lord, and then that the Holy Spirit would have liberty in the hearts of these, your children. Lord God, that, that we would lay down our preconceived notions. Lord God, that we would lay down uh, uh, our beliefs. And Lord, just let the truth be the truth. Lord, as I've studied this before and this week, Lord, you have pricked my heart. Lord, I've asked the question that these here ask, what shall I do? What shall we do? Lord, what do you want of me? Lord, and I pray that would be the heart of each one here. Lord, as your spirit moves, Lord, as your Holy Ghost convicts, Lord God, that we would turn and say, Lord, what shall I do? Lord, I ask this. I promise to give you the praise of the Lord, and I ask it in Jesus' name. I don't want to re-preach anything from last week, but I want to talk to you today about the purpose of what happened. Last week we talked about the fact that as the church was assembled, they had come together, they were in one accord in one place, remember? What does that mean? They were in the same place, and they were of the same mind. While it hadn't been written yet, I would say that their mind was that of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. I believe these folks were not worried about their reputation. They were not worried about their livelihood. They were not worried about uh, what was happening at home. They were not worried about what was going on at work. They were not worried about what uh, they might be missing out on. They were worried about what Jesus wanted them to do. That was their mind. That was it. And because their mind was where it was supposed to be and their butts were the, where they were supposed to be, the Holy Spirit did what only he could do. And we talked a little bit last week, I believe, that you have 120 Christians, 120 disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ that had now been endued, uh, empowered by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that it was as cloven tongues of fire that rested on each and every one of them. A prophecy from Joel saying that even your sons and your daughters will prophesy of me. The fulfillment of the prophecy happening, them knowing the prophecy, them knowing this is what's happening, they go out to the places where they were at, where the commerce was being made. I would say it was like going down here to nine, where that strip, those strip malls are all right there. We got Walmart and Home Depot and the new Chipotle, Chick-fil-A coming soon. Okay, and you have all the restaurants and all the stuff that goes on there, the bank. I would say they were in a place that we would consider much like that, a place where just a lot of business happens. They left wherever it was they were meeting, and they go out and they just start talking to people about Jesus. I imagine Peter was sharing the story of how he was out, out fishing one day, and along comes Jesus, this guy Andrew had told him about his brother. I imagine Peter would tell his testimony of how he was just a dirty old fisherman that God did something amazing in his life. I imagine he shared how uh, uh, he followed him for three and a half years and had no idea who it was he was following. I imagine he shared with the simple fact that as he followed him, he learned more of him and wanted to serve him more until the day came where he could really show his true colors, and he did. And guess what? It didn't change how Jesus felt about him. I imagine this is what Peter was saying to those that he came across as John was sharing a quite similar story. And then maybe Nathaniel had a different story. And maybe uh, 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 Mary uh, the, the, of Magdalene was telling how she had been possessed with demons and how that Jesus Christ freed her from that and gave her liberty to live for him. I imagine his mother Mary and James, his brother, were out telling him, listen, I've known him his whole life. He was amazing. We knew him his whole life, and he didn't know that he was, and we didn't realize just who he was. Did I miss something? Oh, you're looking at me, pointing like, the Holy Spirit show up and I missed it? All right. I'm distracted easily, I'm sorry. Here they are, they're sharing their testimonies of what Jesus did. And they're speaking what they know. But they're talking to Athenians and Peruthians. And I don't remember all the other Ians that were there, okay? But there was a bunch of them that didn't speak Hebrew. But they were hearing in their own language. You know, that would freak me out. 
Jerry, if I go down here, if I go down to the Chinese restaurant down here, the, the bamboo garden, okay, and I go in there and there's a lady there in establishment and she doesn't speak real good English, and I started talking to her as fast as I could about Jesus, and then she was understanding what I was saying because let me tell you something, Oftentimes I've been down there and she doesn't always understand what I'm saying and I definitely don't always understand what she's saying. But man, if I'm talking about Jesus and she starts to weep as the Holy Spirit convicts her and pricks her heart of her sins, what an amazing thing that would be for me to see God do that. But I'm trying to help you guys understand that's what's going on. And people are going, what? What is happening? How do you know about my life? How are you speaking to me right now. Aren't you just a regular person? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Think about that. God uses regular people. We don't have an excuse, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. The entire church was out there being used by God. The entire church and what happens is these people start, well, 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 do you hear? They're speaking in my language. Are you hearing in your language? Yeah, I'm hearing in my language. These are, these are wonderful things they're saying. What do we do? What, what, what the, and the people are saying, look, just come with me. Just come with me. I'm going to take you to a place. And, and the church start inviting folks to where they were meeting. Okay? And you might be like, well, I don't see that in Scripture. It's there. It's there. Because see, Peter was just out there witnessing just like everybody else. Until they started to wonder what was going on. And because people saw something powerful in the lives of the church, because people saw something supernatural in the lives of the church, they wanted to know what was going on. And so they were willing to go with him. So then we get to where we read today. Peter gets to preach. Peter just an old fisherman. Peter, the one who argued with Jesus continually. Peter, the one who had enough faith to get out of a perfectly good boat and go walking on water. Peter, who quit walking on water and started to sink. Peter, who swore he'd never leave Jesus. Not only did he leave him and forsake him, but he denied him even knowing him. Peter, who went back to his old life, forsook what God was trying to do in his life. But because his Savior loved him so much, he restored their relationship. Peter, the one who Jesus said, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Peter gets up and he preaches this message. He starts telling them, y'all know Jesus, right? I know you know Jesus. Jesus is not a foreign name to you that are here. Jesus' Jesus's fame has spread out, way outside of Israel. I hope you understand this. And these people, they were not foreign to who Jesus was. They were not foreign to what had happened. Forty days had passed, at least. We know that 40 days had passed since Jesus' crucifixion. We know that there was at least 40 days and almost two weeks, at the very least, we're talking about 64 days has passed. Now, while they didn't have Instagram and, and Twitter and, and social media and, and the news and all those things, I guarantee you the word has spread outside of Jerusalem who Jesus was. Sorry. You're okay. And so Peter says, this Jesus that you've heard about, and then he says something bold. You killed him. Now listen, I don't think everybody that was in this place were there the day that Jesus died. I don't think that. But you see what the church had been doing was they were going out and they were telling people, listen, I'm just a sinner. I'm just somebody who has been redeemed by God himself. And I want to tell you what he's doing. And he wants to redeem you, a sinner. They'd already been told. Do you understand something? You can tell people hard things. You can tell people things that are hard when they know how you feel about it. And you're going to be like, well, how do you know, how, how do they know how they felt about him? It doesn't take me very long if I've just met someone to see their heart. To see whether it's about them or what it's about. 
I know it's not very hard for some people to see my heart when I come. Because sometimes it's about me and what I want to accomplish. But we're talking about people who are filled with the Holy Ghost. Have been endued with His power. They weren't talking about who they were. They were talking about who He was and what He had done. And this had invoked such wonder and awe that the people came. And so Peter, here he is, he's preaching. And he tells them, Jesus, he was God. Jesus was God. Jesus, he was beaten and crucified by you. And I, I, I believe I'm talking to people that understand this. I'm not trying to win anyone to Christ this morning. But if you need one to Christ, I can't do it, but he can. He said he was crucified and beaten and crucified by you, but he has risen for you. And he's alive, and we can all attest to it. Everybody that's talked to you about Jesus today, they watched him rise from the dead. They've watched him ascend to heaven. We've witnessed this. And then he says this, it's my sins, it's your sins that the Messiah did all this for. It was a great message. He used the word of God. Talked about somebody they all knew. David. Told them what David said. Told them what the Bible said. Told them things they were already supposed to know. You guys ready for some honesty? Yeah. Thanks, Bell. I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. Might be some kids in here may not know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking to you adults. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And those of you that are watching online, I'm not saying anything you guys don't know. So what happened? These people that Peter was preaching to, and we know that there was more than 3,000. We know there was more than 3,000. This is quite the crowd that has gathered here. You know why that more than 3,000 people had gathered? Because some people were being obedient to do what Jesus told them to do. They were serving their Savior. And because they were serving their Savior, they had a power to do what only he could do. These convicted Individuals cry out, what can I do? What shall we do? What? Okay, okay, my sins crucified him. I get it. Okay, I'm a sinner. I'm responsible for his death. But you say he did it for me and he rose for me, so then what do I do now? I've got the information. What happens now? Peter said, repent for remission and be baptized to receive God's power in your life. And I want you to understand something. I want to be very careful about this, okay? This is not where the Holy Ghost comes from. Okay? You remember John the Baptist? He says, I baptize with water. But there one who is before, before me that comes after me that is going to baptize you with what? Anybody remember? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is what John said, but yes. See, these folks that got saved, and I know, I know because I've seen the pictures that it, folks have drawn uh, of, of a long line of people getting ready to get baptized by water so they can receive the Holy Ghost. Folks, that is not what happened. I don't mind, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist. But I'm not a Baptist because I believe everybody needs to get in that tank. I'm a Baptist because I believe everybody needs to be completely immersed in all that God is. And that's what happened that day? They that received the word gladly. What word? Repent! You're convicted? Guess what? Don't stay that way. I had a man tell me one time, he quit coming. I went by his house. I said, hey man, what's going on? Actually, Brett and I went by his house. Hey man, what, why'd you quit coming? Well, I don't like coming to your church. Okay, what did I do? Well, I don't feel good when I leave. I always feel bad. What do you mean? 
Well, you always make me feel bad about who I am. I said, I do? Well, I mean, when you preach, I'm like, Repent! Amen. Repent! Do you understand God makes you feel bad about who you are so you can feel good about who he is? That's what God does. That's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to let him do. You know, I got baptized by the Holy Ghost in September of 1998. I got baptized. I mean, God got all over me, and then he got all over me. God made me feel real bad about where I was and who I was, and then he made me feel real good about who I was in him. I got baptized by the Holy Ghost. And guess what? I've been baptized by the Holy Ghost several times since then. And it wasn't in a tank. Every time that I get convicted, every time that the Holy Spirit pricks my heart, and I say, okay, God, what do I do? You know, most of us don't need to ask what we need to do. Most of us know exactly what we need to do. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We need to repent. And we need to ask him to baptize us one more time. It's not about being reborn again. It's about being restored in your relationship with him. Because see, here's the thing. There are people that need to see Jesus. And I know I say this a lot. Guess what? I'm going to keep saying it. You want to know why? I need to remind her all the time that people need to see Jesus in my life. And not just you guys, but people in Greenfield, the people that I see every day, my family, my neighbors, your family, your neighbors. People need to see Jesus. People at Walmart need to see Jesus. And that don't mean you wear a big picture of Jesus on your chest. Okay, not that that's a bad thing if that's what you want to do. Hey, whatever you can do to get a conversation started. I want you to see something here. There was a purpose. Because see, a lot of, uh, uh, I say this a lot, and I want to be careful about this. Because I don't want to just make a brash statement, okay? But I've heard a lot of people preach about the day of Pentecost and excuse it away as a thing of the past. No, pastor's not going apostolic. Okay? I might be a little Baptocostal, and I'm trying to explain why. Okay? I believe that God is just as powerful today as he was in this day of Pentecost. And there was a purpose for this. There was a reason this happened. We talked about the reason, but there was a purpose this was happening. The purpose for Pentecost was, was so that the world would see Jesus in the body of Christ. Well, it's the body of Christ. Yes, we're supposed to be the body of Christ, but are we the body of Christ? Jesus was ascended. His promised comforter came. This happened because of obedience. If the church were not where they were supposed to be, then I don't know that God could have imbued them and empowered them like he had. And they were working together to obey Christ. So empowered by the Holy Ghost, and we've talked about these, the church, and I want you to know something. Listen now. I guarantee you, out of 120 people, are you listening? Everybody listening? I guarantee you, out of 120 people, there were some introverts in there. You introverts? There were some introverts in there. Guess what they were doing? See, the Holy Ghost gave them power to say the things that they didn't like saying. To talk to the people they didn't like talking to. The Holy Ghost used them. The church, even the introverts, told those they encountered about the works of Christ in their lives. Then those, they were told, were moved to seek what was going on. They came to hear a gospel message. They were willing to do whatever they needed to do to be comforted of the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And the kingdom of God was added to. The purpose, the purpose was that God Almighty was glorified. See, speaking in tongues, which is what we call the day of Pentecost, what they were doing. Speaking in tongues, which plainly put, means they were speaking or being heard in a different language than what they spoke. Okay? Speaking in tongues is simply about a different language. But the Holy Ghost was doing something supernatural that Galileans speaking Hebrew were being heard by Parthenians that did not speak Hebrew. But here's the thing. I don't think that's a thing of the past. 
And I shared this last week. I believe the night that I got saved, the guy was preaching on apostasy. Had nothing to do with salvation. But I needed salvation. I needed Jesus. So Jesus, the Holy Ghost, came and convicted me that I needed to get saved. And so you know what? I said, what do I do? And I knew what I needed to do. I just accepted Christ. What happened? He spoke what he knew. I heard what I needed. That's how it works. Guess what? The night I got saved, it was supernatural. It was a supernatural work in the Holy Ghost. And guess what? I'm not special. And neither is Norman Glasgow. And neither is Christy Hoff and Larry Groves. And everybody else that God used to speak into my life to get me saved. They were just who God used to help me get saved. Who helped you get saved? Thank God for the one that God used to speak into your life. So you said, what do I do? So now what do we do? Well, we need to do what the church did. We need to be where we're supposed to be and be in the right mind. See, here's the thing. You know, I know we're not all going to agree on all the little preferences. The colors of wood and carpet and shirt and tie or not shirt and tie. Type of music or not type of music. I know we're not going to all agree on all those preferences. I know we're not going to all agree on those things. But see, that's not what we need for unity. You know, God says he hates, he hates, it's an abomination, yea, those that sow discord among the brethren. And you're be like, well, I'm not sowing discord. If you have something that you need to say about someone, and you say it to everybody else but that someone, and it's your church family, I don't care where, even if it's not your church family, that's just wrong. That's sowing discord. If you're not speaking life, Listen, <laughs> if you're not speaking life, you're sowing discord. If we're not trying to edify and exhort one another, and listen, hey, and if what I'm saying bothers you, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And I find that every time that I get offended by what someone is saying, then I've lost my peace. And I would say, quit looking for a reason to be upset and look for Jesus. I'm going to do my best to let you see him here. I'm going to mess up. Are you listening? I'm going to mess up. There's times you guys are going to see Larry Hoff. Sorry, I'm, I'm not perfect. Just like there's times that I'm going to see Justin Painter Bob Lyons and Sue Tillman. Okay? But that doesn't mean that I still can't see Jesus in your life and you can't see Jesus in my life. But if I'm not looking for Jesus, what am I looking for? Especially here in the church atmosphere. You want to talk about, you want to talk about having unity in church, folks? Quit looking for a reason to be upset with somebody. Quit looking for a reason to let, you know, your, your fellowship to be hindered. And look for a reason for your fellowship to be stronger. So how do we do that? We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, endured suffering. So we don't like enduring. We don't like when people don't like what we like. We don't like when people don't like who we are. We don't like when people say things we don't like. That was an electronic amen. I made reference last week that I want our church to be alive. And I'm going to be absolutely honest. There are those that felt like I was saying something that I wasn't. Okay? I still don't think our church is what it's supposed to be. I don't. I don't think we have the life in us that we're supposed to have. It. And if you disagree with that, I'm sorry. That's my perspective. And it's one that's been convicting me for about nine years now. Okay? And it's one that I'm going to pursue. We're about to pray here in a few minutes. Okay? We're going to pray. We're going to end the service. We're going to have our Sunday afternoon prayer. And we're praying for God to use this church in Hancock County. But guess what, folks? God's not going to use this church. Now, he might use some in this church, but I want God to use this church. I don't want God to just use me. I want him to use me, but I don't want it to be just me. I want it to be this church. I want this church 
to come alive for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want this church to have the Holy Ghost power on our lives as we go out and do what we do. God says, hey, let's talk to him about Jesus. So we do. And so what do they do? Well, well, hey, that's great that you're telling me, so now what do I do? And we can say, well, let's, let's go to church and we can have people come in here and we can tell them the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I want that to be what we're about. But let's just be honest. It's not what we're about. We're about coming to church on Sunday morning, going home on Sunday afternoon. Am I saying anything that's untrue? Even those of us that serve in the furniture ministry. Okay? Let's just be honest. We're doing the minimum. Is your heart being pricked? Mine is. And if your heart isn't being pricked, could I talk to you about Jesus? Heads around and eyes are closed. I want this church to be alive. If this church ever is going to be alive, it's not going to be because of Larry Hoff. I can have nothing to do with it except for surrender all that I am to all that he is. And if this church is ever going to be alive, you're going to have to do the same thing. Each and every one of you. That's not to say there aren't those here that are alive and in Christ and following him to their best, abil- their, their best of their ability. And if you think that's what I'm saying, maybe you need Jesus. I want this church to be alive. I want to be alive. I want people to see Jesus in my life. I want you to see Jesus in my life. I want this church to be the Jesus that Hancock County needs. So what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? I mean, I, I'm, I'm at that point right now where I'm saying, Lord, what do we do? And so we're about to pray. I'm going to dismiss. But you love me anyway. It's like nothing.